Okay, everyone, uh, let's get going here. I think the whole purpose of this was to uh, assemble as many people as possible with a really exciting topic, and clearly that hasn't worked. Um, but I think it's very timely to talk about this whole idea of like, oh, you know, do we give people a break? Do we rest them? Um, why is there a need for rest when, you know, when I used to watch, well, let's use basketball as an example. When I used to watch basketball, I don't think many people missed a game. You know, guys were getting like slammed to the ground and, um, you know, beat up every game. And, and then, then there was playoffs too. So um, what I'm trying to figure out is, is this a, would we call this like an accepted practice of resting people uh, as a result of the fact that maybe they aren't prepared um, or, you know, or, or do we blame everybody and say, listen, you got to make sure these guys are prepared. They're part of your team and you're just going to run into problems. Like I want to see what happens this year with that same player uh, with the Clippers as opposed to the Raptors um, and see if they're resting them, resting them, resting them. Maybe they don't even make the playoffs. Maybe they lose in the first round and then it's kind of a waste. It's like uh, I, my wife loves watching Survivor. I don't know if you guys watch that. I think it's more of a female thing. But then people will find like, oh, I have an immunity idol. I have two, I have three. And then they get voted out because they don't use their immunity idol. And it's like, oh, that was a waste of time. So I'm wondering if that's going to be the case where you're saving up for games because you're going to make the playoffs, then you don't make the playoffs or you're just not ready once the playoffs come. Rob, I'm going to get you to start off, get your thoughts in it, especially from this idea that this guy has an injury. I think they're saying this, this one player has a knee problem and what are your thoughts like should we just maybe just get good rehab and get them in shape and or is this a legit, legitimate concern in terms of uh what you see from it you know first of all you never the only people who know actually what's going on are the people involved right those doctors those trainers the player and his agent so everything else we're going to discuss about situations like that is speculation but with regards to injuries, I think there's always something you can do, right? We know in the literature and stuff that there's crossover effect, right? If you if you injure one leg, you could exercise the other leg, and there's crossover effect of training, whether it's, you know, increasing strength in the injured leg, whatever it may be. You could, uh, you know, put people on their feet, <clears throat> have them lock their knees and hips and do things like muscle cleans and presses, which – essentially is working the whole body and there's got to be a carryover effect if they're allowed to weight bear you know you could have them bench press and keep them strong you know in the upper body those types of things and it will have a carryover to lower extremities so i'm a big believer that you know you have to do something because atrophy and loss of physical qualities happen so rapidly that you know it's tough to get it back so as far as injuries that's that's my viewpoint on it well, and the other question is, do you think these guys, when they sit out a game, are they increasing their volume of rehab exercises, strength training to make up for maybe whatever issue they have, whatever deficit they have? Do you think that's going on or are they just business as usual, but we rest the game? Well, I, I don't know, but I could tell you this. I just think, I believe in the concept of periodization and I believe in unloading and I believe that people need to rest from time to time, right? There's, there's an off season for a reason. But I believe that you stay fresh by staying strong. You don't stay fresh by, uh, by resting all the time. And, and that's been my experience. That's been my belief. That's been my philosophy. Right or wrong, that's what I go by. That's what's worked for me. Yeah, just creating a reserve so that, you know, they have the capacity when, when they need to be on the floor. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, hey, Banta, are you okay to talk? Are you making some, uh, some fusilli or something like that? I can talk. What you got? Um, I know in track and field, you have all these people who are like, well, I'm going to taper down every meet and I'm going to get people fresh. Like what, what has been your experience with that? Like if you do that too much. Well, the whole feed the cats, right. And versus long to short or that system. I think the problem is you got to pick your spots in which you want to work. You know, just like Bob said, or Robert said that, uh, 
you know, periodization is really important in that regards, not necessarily because you truly believe in peaking, but that you just don't want to screw them up in critical times. So you want to make sure that, you know, they're fresh enough in order to compete at a high level and that we're not doing anything silly by taking a risk and getting them injured. I like to have planned breaks and downtime as opposed to forced downtime through injury. And when you're looking at peaking and things like that, uh, to get them ready to go, you still have to do the work ahead of time to prepare them for that. I'm not a person that believes we race people into shape because then that my job means nothing. Then I don't really move the needle. And I believe as coaches through progressive loading, uh, even at the high school level, year to year, our kids are going to get faster and they're going to get better. Um, for me, particularly, I did a research study with like the last 10 years of female athletes in Missouri at the state championships. You got like the top 30 in each class and overwhelmingly so the majority of those athletes were seniors, which kind of goes against that idea that early maturing high school freshmen in America girls can impact your varsity team right away. And that whole idea that those kids get burnt out over time. It sounds like to me, looking at that data, that ultimately our job actually matters, maturing matters, our training matters. And if you're not doing work, you're never going to be able to get them to a place where they need to be. It's kind of like in baseball where we have all this load management and none of these guys can pitch nine innings, but Bob Gibson would throw complete games, meet, even giving people sweet chin music and, you know, had a low, low ERA and was able to put people out game in and game out all the time. And now we have like middle relievers and, you know, your flamethrowers at the end of the game. And I think part of that is because we've created a system, which is good to protect young people from abusive coaches. But what it also does is it doesn't let the more gritty or what I would say maybe biomechanically correct athlete to rise to the top that can handle the rigors of a 150 plus game season. So it's interesting how that works out. This is kind of my thoughts. Yeah, like, do you guys yeah. think that playing into shape is acceptable? Like, is that enough, right, uh, Rob? Yeah, no, just that uh, Ryan brought that up. Just coincidentally, I was speaking to Johnny Parker this morning, who's a big Cardinals fan, and we were speaking about Bob Gibson, who's one of his favorite players. In 67, Gibson pitched 32 games, and of the 32 games he pitched, 28 were complete with an ERA of 1.18. I forget how many he won, but I, I believe, you know, what, uh, what Coach just said, I, I think that based on the systems, and I think especially with the money, that athletes are being paid now, we're creating an assist, a system of extinction. These people aren't able to pitch complete games because they think we're afraid to have them pitch so often because of the money that's being spent. And, and I could be wrong, that's just my opinion, but I think you know a lot of these things as we've evolved to protecting the players maybe has, has hurt them and has hurt their performance in regards to uh, where we think we have longevity, maybe we don't. I mean, we may have longer careers, but they're certainly not pitching as many complete games, et cetera. So. Yeah, and, and if you're paying them, I don't know how much baseball players get paid, like top players, but if you're paying them like $20 million a year, would you not expect more output? Or at least the same? No. Yeah, I, I mean, I, that's kind of crazy. Um, uh, I, I don't know if this is happening in all sports. Is this happening in ice hockey too? Is anybody, Clint, do you know what's going on with ice, pro ice hockey? Are they resting players? Um, is that is that a common thing now? And in, in not just, I think we're looking at basketball for one thing. Baseball, I assume that's happening. Uh, I don't know about ice hockey. Football, there's only so few, there's so few games. I think it, it's not, they can't do that. It's just not um uh, effective to do that but anybody have any thoughts on other sports uh kyle wait well unmute you there hey yeah uh actually it was funny that you mentioned that uh last night in the boston bruins game or a couple nights ago in the bruins game they joked about uh the raptors uh load management and they do that up there but somebody actually got load ma load managed uh for the bruins um I think it was patrice bergeron got uh was out just because and they they mentioned that in the uh so I, I don't know if it's coming into hockey now but uh i know the leafs had somebody um a few games ago as well that was being load managed so i think we're going to start to see it creep into 
the NHL at this point, but it's still early days from what I've seen. Yeah, well, it's, it's certainly a buzzword. So I think, um, you know, I think it allows people to be less effective on many fronts. So like, one, the physical preparation two, the rehab. Right. So if you're not rehabbing somebody properly, you just keep pulling them out because you're like, ah, we're not sure if they're ready. So it, it, it's creating a lot of issues. And even that issue of, well, what the fans are paying for a ticket and then they find out that this guy's not going to play. And so somebody joked about, well, maybe if they paid like uh, Apple Care, they would get some money back for each game that the, the player missed or something like some insurance on their ticket, which is absolutely ridiculous now, too. Um, anybody else want to jump in uh just on based on what they've seen in different sports and, and the other thing is you know will the, i mean i don't know if this will creep into college sports but maybe it will you know somebody else want to jump in anyone <laughs> I, I could tell you this um and i'm probably the old timer here on this zoom pop but we used to work the off season with the giants there was no cba um there was not a lot of free agency with regards to how it is today because the money isn't what it was back then. And um, the team, you know, there wasn't a lot of private facilities that, that people would go to to train upon their own or the agents sending players. So when I worked with Coach Parker, the Giants, their off seasons for the seven years I helped Johnny was anywhere from 20 to 22 weeks. That was our off season of training. And for years, you know, the Giants, amongst other teams, had the lowest, the very low injury rates during the season. Hal Vermeil, you know, his, his guys just trained. And, you know, I know Michael Jordan is a specimen and the uh, outlier. But, you know, there was one year Michael Jordan won NBA championship, played in the Olympics, and, and played a full next season and won another NBA championship. So he played. And, you know, Al, Al will tell you, and Derek, you know this, you know, you, you talk to Al often, they just trained hard and they just trained often and they had very low injury rates as well. So I just think that, you know, if you, if you establish a work capacity, which a lot of people don't, they just throw them right into training. So you establish that work capacity before you enter your formalized training and then you train for at least 12 weeks, if not longer. I think as you go into your season, I think you'll be in pretty good shape. I mean, there are no absolutes and, you know, accidents, especially in games like hockey or football, very physical sports, you can't help. But I, I think you'll be best prepared in those situations versus, you know, tra training however and then having people rest and, and for the sake of resting and with rest comes deconditioning. So. Yeah. Can we talk about that in regards to even like a rehab model and physical therapy model? Isn't your job to like not make sure that that they people don't detrain de too much and their their uh, their activity levels don't sink too low, uh, even just as part of getting them back to full health? Yeah, well, you're going to have limitations, especially if someone had surgery, right? Because it's not only the operative limb, it's especially if it's a lower extremity, it's the non-involved limb too, because you're limited to what you can do. And that's what I stated before. There's always something you can do, even with limitations, whether even it's with the upper body. I do believe that, um, you know, over a progressive time, when appropriate and safe, and that's the, the art of anything we do, right? Whether it's rehab or coaching, you need load. You need to get people strong because, you know, strength is a physical quality that is the foundation for where all other physical qualities evolve. And if you're just going to let people rest or, or not, you know, um, not apply appropriate loading or intensity, which could be, depending on the stage of therapy or training, could be, you know, weights on a bar, velocity and running, jump heights, whatever it may be. You need to apply unaccustomed loads because that's how adaptation is going to take place. If they're doing things that are usual and customary, how do we expect any adaptation to take place? And if we're applying those usual and customary loads out of fear or whatever it may be, then, you know, we're not doing just to the patient or the athlete. So, yeah, I think that you have to take people to the proverbial line. And I think that over time, periodically, you have to really start to load them. Thank you. Um, we have uh, iPhone raised their hand. So that's the only name I have. So your iPhone. 
Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't know how to change my name. I'll do it <laughs> next time. But um, so my real name is uh, Luca. I um, I work with um, a lot of like all my clients are CFL players, and uh, like the the thing that I I see a lot is in the load management, is in the strength and conditioning where guys refrain themselves from from working out because they think that that's what's going to keep them healthy but and the coaches buy into it too but it makes absolutely no sense because we could all agree that like a body that moves is a body that's going to heal itself right so i think that what guys or what athletes like football players need to really really understand and um is that it's not about like cutting the amount of work that you're putting it's about stepping up your recovery game so like don't cut down on lifting weights or getting into the gym and just moving especially when uh, like it's a question of rehab but ensure make sure that like your nutrition is on point make sure that you're taking supplements make sure that you're going in for therapy like there's a bunch of things that you could do before cutting down the volume of your strength training it's I, that that's my perspective on things yeah i mean good point are people just lazier does anybody have any thoughts on that does this have nothing to do with like best practices but people are just lazy anybody want to comment see that that's kind of a hint like maybe you could contribute and not sit back and rest and load manage during the zoom pop yeah <laughs> I don't know if it's like I don't know if it's laziness to be honest. I think like fear. Yeah, there's like fe- like I think there's a lack of education. Um, there's also like a fear of getting like. So here's what I, I see like in the CFL, is that there's the guys that are American players that come up to play in the CFL, and every guy that I've talked to that plays in the CFL that's American. They feel like their strength training down south um, hurt their body. Like they just felt like they got run down all the time. So when they come to the CFL, they are more talented than Canadian players. They are also, um, how you say, like they're better conditioned than Canadian players. So them resting doesn't necessarily affect them. Should they train? I think so. Like, I like. The, so the guys that I trained in season this year were all the healthiest players on my team. The guys that didn't train ended up being on the, the injury reserve. But, I mean, like, like I'm not pointing fingers or anything. These are just, like, speculations that I see, right? But I, I really think that, like, guys should step up the recovery and keep on training, like, like some of my guys were training up to like four days a week in season and still producing on the field. And they all came to me with like, at the preseason, they all came to me with like hamstring pulls, lower back injuries, uh, ankle injuries. And then through the season, we worked through everything. And what was really, really interesting is that a lot of those players actually ended up like in season hitting better lifts, uh, hitting like deeper squats, and just getting overall stronger. So, like, I mean, like, the numbers don't lie at the end of the day, right? Like, if if you're performing in the gym, if you're squatting more, power cleaning more, you're going to jump higher. So, guaranteed, you're a better athlete on the field. So, I think there's – you just got to do the work. But guys need to be educated towards it. And I think that's going to remove the fear. But I think the education part is a big thing. I mean, uh, good – point there do you think that sometimes maybe some in college people go overboard with conditioning and maybe it's not you know maybe it's not done as precisely as it could be um does anybody have any thoughts on that where did where'd where'd mr roof go chris roof can you comment on that and what you've seen uh in the college environment i see he's online i don't know if he's listening (laughs) Okay. Anyone else want to comment? Is, is there, I could jump in again. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So two, uh, two aha moments with regards to that situation happened when I was at the hospital for special surgery. And I think I mentioned this in our last Zoom pop. It was a research study done that they looked at 
the effect of exercise <laughs> on a normal rotator cuff. And um, there's a force couple between the rotator cuff and the deltoid, right? So the, what the ro main function of the rotator cuff is, if you don't know, is to keep the head of the humerus in the center of the glenoid, while the deltoid is really a strong factor trying to pull that humeral head superiorly as the arm raises. And what this study showed was that an, a, a fatigued rotator cuff can't resist the pull of the deltoid. It's the disruption of that force couple. So when you raise your arm, the head of the humerus will migrate superiorly the same way with someone that has a torn rotator cuff. So that's the first thing, my first aha moment. Second aha moment is again, I go back to the giants. We used to work those 20, 22 weeks. And at one point in time, we had a former Soviet weightlifter and Soviet coach teaching us our programming. And as we were going through, I really think that the Soviet coach was looking at football players as weightlifters and not as American football players, right? So we broke, we broke our repetitions up monthly. And by our fourth block, we went from like 12, 1400, 1600, 1800 reps. And our 1800 rep blocks, guys really started getting sore, their knees, their backs, et cetera. So those two educational experience for me was, you've got to watch your exercise volume. Right, I, I though I know volume and intensity goes hand in hand. I think it's volume that'll kill you, and I, I agree with what Coach said before with regards to heavy lifting in season, off season, etc. But I just think you have to watch out how much, and that's where work capacity prior to a formal training program will assist you not only in the ability to perform your system, but also assist in recovery. But I think when these people feel exhausted or they feel you know, tired or they start to break down with soft tissue type aspect injuries, it's, a, it's usually excessive volume with regards to they can't handle those, those volumes versus the inability to handle loads. Do you think that if the volume is excessive, like singularly, so like if I say, we're just going to practice a lot and then we're just going to run gassers a lot and there's like say two things versus uh we're going to practice we're going to do some weightlifting we're going to do some recovery base work we're going to do some other work over here maybe on sprinting or plyometrics do you think if you diversify your volume you can not only make yourself stronger but also maybe accumulate more volume as opposed to like just hitting the same nail all the time i think you can but i think you also have to look at add all the pieces together for an accumulative volume as well. And that is your overload work, workload, right? Either, you know, you've trained your athletes to be able to handle those workloads or the program was excessive in the amount of work they have to perform and they're going to start to break down. And there's no absolutes, right? That's the talent of coaching, in my opinion, or that's the talent of rehab. I mean, if you think, if you look at rehab, if you think of rehab, if you do, 10 exercises, you know, in rehab, sometimes a lot of people like to use three sets of 10 for whatever reason, all right? It's just, if you do 10, 10 exercises for three sets of 10, let's say over 12 weeks, you're on pace to do something of like, give or take 43,000 exercise repetitions annually, give or take. I forget the number, but now it's in the 40,000s. When my experiences years ago, talking to coaches with USA weightlifting, they were trying to achieve 25,000 reps in a year. I mean, so in a rehab setting with a non quote unquote normal person, I mean, we just keep adding, traditionally a lot of times people will add exercises on the front end and not take anything away from the back end. And eventually you can overtrain someone during the course of rehab just for the amount of work and the amount of volume that you've applied on someone who's not even quote unquote normal, whatever that is. And so there's no difference in that rehab setting, in my opinion, versus a training situation, right? You don't train, you know, I'll quote you, you don't train marathons by running marathons, right? It's an accumulative effect. And so I, I really have believed that when it comes to workloads, that you really have to look at your volumes, though volume intensity goes hand in hand, it's volumes that'll kill you, excessive volumes of work. Yeah. Uh, Coach Roof, 
Um, there was a comment before, I don't know if you'd heard it, but it was about, um, you know, some pro players, when they went to pros, they were kind of turned off by strength and conditioning because maybe they were excessively worked in college. What do, you, what do you see happening in college in terms of managing loads properly from a strength and conditioning side to the in-season practice, gameplay, travel? Like, how do, you, how do you look at that in terms of being kind of a performance director? Well, I think it's something that everybody – tries to do with best intentions. I think there's a lot of variables that are uncontrollable. Uh, you, you're dealing with some kids that come in from high school. And I think uh, the, term, the work capacity has gotten thrown around quite a bit in this talk, which, I, which obviously is very important. But I think what we're seeing a lot of times is um, that some of these young athletes maybe have spent the vast majority of their time doing things that you would consider specific work capacity in nature and don't do very much general work capacity in their development. So again, just spending too much time playing their sports uh, growing up. I, I thought back to the example about Bob Gibson being able to pitch 28 out of 32 complete games. Um, but I'm willing, I'm willing to bet that he had a lot less mileage on his arm at that point in the pros than what probably a lot of college pitchers have on their arms by that time. Maybe that's why there's a, they, they need middle relievers and, and closers and everything like that is to by the time that athlete gets to the pros, they've pitched so many innings. And, uh, and for the most part, the, the power capabilities and athletic expression of these individuals is in the sport as a whole has improved over time. Uh, so maybe uh, the load management is needed um, from just from that stamp standpoint, like they've got so much mileage on them coming into this point. Uh, you know, we see it with our uh, Olympic sport type athletes, uh, you know, your soccer, softballs, volleyballs, tennis, they just spend their whole time growing up playing that sport and don't get a lot of time to really develop and mature physically. Uh, and sometimes you can make the case when you watch some of these athletes move uh, that you could say they're very bad athletes, but really good at their sport, if that makes sense. Um, so I think that's the big, that's the big thing that we have to fight against, uh, or uh, fight against, not the right word, but work against with this short window of time that we've got is how do you, how do you fix maybe eight to 10 years of poor physical development? Yeah. Or, I mean, uh, go ahead. Sorry. And, in, in a short amount of time. And we're, we're continually getting limited and more limited in our amount of contact that we can have with these athletes. Uh, so that makes our, makes it a little bit more difficult to fill in those gaps and cover up some or, or fix some much needed areas of, of development weakness. Yeah. Good points there, Chris. Um, you know, just, yeah, I, we didn't even think about all those over specialization overuse issues coming in. Ryan, you uh, had a comment about that. Yeah, so what I was going to say is, I think it also is, uh, I was having a couple private conversations here on the side, but one of the things I think is important to consider too is the nature of the sport. So like baseball is very like unilateral, you're doing a lot of things with only one side of your body, and you're doing them over and over and over again, versus a sport like basketball, where AU is the scourge of my existence. However, I have to admit that more often than not, the young ladies who play basketball who eventually come out to my track and field team are typically the ones who are the most resilient, um, the most athletic by nature, and can handle the loads that we're doing. I think the other thing is, is that it's good to get a little bit of background on your athletes ahead of time. How many sports did you play in high school? How long did you play them? Did you play multiple sports in college? That's a super rare situation. But once you kind of gather that information, then you can kind of figure out also to kind of guide your load and volume and intensity of, of what you're doing. I think the biggest problem is, is that we compete too much and practice too little. And I know you've posted these things, Derek, many, many times, how many ACL injuries we have. And it feels like it's a rash of these things, but it's because they're not allowed to practice that much before the season starts, no two a days, no that kind of stuff. And then when they come to the professional level, They've had that kind of drip down or trickle down to other levels where these athletes are basically forbid from working. 
Um, one of the things that's really frustrating for me in our state is we have to be very careful in how we condition. They give us rules. You can't do anything sports specific. Well, I understand we don't want our athletes to train all year long. But we also don't want it to be so abnormal when they finally do come to us that it puts the body in the doms. We, we risk an injury. We risk what I would say a lack of neural education on what we're asking them to do so that we can progressively load. And so I feel like those are big problems. Um, and the biggest is we just don't have three sport athletes when they're growing up anymore. These kids are playing on some crazy elite academy team for you know an MLS team or something like that in soccer, and they never get to do anything else. They don't even get to play for their high school team anymore. You know, these are kind of things that we're challenged with. And for what? At the end of the day, what are we trying to do? Are we trying to give these kids and young athletes and young men and women a good experience? Are we trying to win? Well, if I'm trying to win, I want my best players healthy and I want them there. And I want them to have the most physical experience they possibly can have. Um, you know, how many times have we seen a really good athlete that was also a wrestler? that played basketball, baseball, and ran track or football, you know, in combination. Most of those are the ones that climb to the top, you know, and I don't know if we're talking about a long-term development model, but we can get a, we can do it without it having to be systematic by just getting the kids to participate in more activities. Yeah. I mean, it seems like what I'm hearing, and I'll let Rob jump in, is that the load management issues you're seeing in pro sport are almost the result of just that poor athlete management in development and earlier stages. And are you seeing this, Rob, in terms of injuries? Like when people come in with injuries, you know, or are you seeing some of these issues? Like they're deficient in general fitness or they're deficient in specific qualities that yeah. unrelated to what they're doing, what their sport is. Absolutely. I'll never, I'll never forget about four or five years ago, I saw an 11 year old kid that had an, arthro had had, uh, an arthroscopy to his elbow. He was a little league pitcher at age 11 because um, he had some bone fragments that he had to have removed due to elbow pain. And, you know, his dad's with him and saying, this kid's the next Roger Clemens. You know, I'm looking at the dad saying, well, guess what? Roger Clemens never had elbow surgery. And it's just, you know, these guys, are, you know, as, as, as um, Ryan said, you know, 24-7, 365, you know, I'm a big believer in what Ryan said. I, th I think when they're young, they're, they're so plastic that the more activities they could participate in, the mo more overwhelming, better athlete they're going to be because, you know, if they're playing soccer, eye foot coordination and lacrosse, eye hand, and gymnastics, total body strength and track speed and endurance, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you put that all together, now when they're 14 years old or so, let's talk about specialization, perhaps at that time, generally going that way. Um, in the 80s, I went to the Soviet Union and uh, studied with the national weightlifting team and some other teams. And we studied at the Soviet Institute of Sport. We would study in the morning and lift or do whatever we did in the afternoon. And, and that program was, you'll never have this in America, but everybody coached the same way throughout the whole country. And if you, did, if you didn't coach that way, you weren't allowed to coach or you had to prove your way was better. And they did general physical preparation. If a person was going to be a weightlifter, they participated in various sports until the age of 12 or so, which only 20% of what they did was weightlifting. And then at 13, it might be 40%. And at 14, it might be 60%. It wasn't until they were 15 or 16 years old where 100% of what they participate in practice and competition was their sport of choice. And you, you know, you have kids nowadays that are, you know, five, six, seven, eight years old. They're going to be yes. You know, they're going to be a baseball player. They're going to be a football player, whatever it may be. And, you know, chances are they are not going to make it, you know, and, uh, and chances are they're probably going to get injured. And you have situations in college, maybe coach roof, you can answer this question. You have a freshman in high school that's rarely trained that has participated 24 seven in one sport, let's say soccer, they get to school in August and their first soccer game is 10 to 12 days later. Like, what do you do with that person? You know, and, and I don't know, that's a situation that we have here in New York where you know, we do some work at St. John's still and we've got freshmen coming in in August and 14 days later, they have their first soccer game and they've never trained in their life. And then they get hurt and you wonder why. So, 
Yeah. Um, Anthony brought up a point about, you know, can we collect data to determine workloads accurately for different sports, different qualities? And I don't know. I don't know. Like, I mean, if you just look at GPS data and total distance run, that's one thing. And there's some inertial data that I don't even know if we know how to make use of that. But yeah, but I have a, I have a question on that. If anybody can answer this, I've asked this question before and I never, I've never gotten a straight answer. And I'll make an analogy. Okay. So Ryan, you train somebody to become faster in the 40. Okay. You have someone that's going to go to a combine. And at the time, you only have a handheld stopwatch. So they run a, a four, four, five, right? And then electronic timers come out and now use an electronic timer and they run a four, four, eight, let's just say, okay? The, the equipment was able to provide a more accurate reading of the results of your training program. So when people are using GPS say, at, th at 3,000 yards, that's too much yardage or guys are too tired. Is that a factor that 3,000 yards is truly too much workload or were our training programs inefficient so they couldn't handle 300 yards and three, I mean 3,000 yards and 3,000 yards should be a standard they should be able to handle. So what is the GPS telling us? Does GPS have standards? And I don't use GPS. I don't have GPS. And probably what I know about GPS, you could fit on the head of a pen. But I just question some of these. When we use machines for data and we're told that these are, uh, these are inf this is the information that data tells us, um, again, are they true loads that our people aren't able to handle? Or is it a factor that our training is insufficient and those are loads they should try, they should handle. And no one's ever been able to answer that for me in regards to GPS. Yeah, I don't know. Does anybody have any thoughts on that in terms of the validity of that data to set standards and say like, hey, this is the ceiling for this athlete? Or, I mean, do you compare athletes against other athletes? Or is it just, you know, you look at somebody's own mileage? And it's an interesting question. I don't, I don't think there's some good answers out there. Coach Alejo? Present. <laughs> you think I, people, my, I, did, I did it on my phone. I feel like I'm like Star Wars now. <laughs> You're so advanced. Um, do you Panarello think. Panarello is going to call me later and say, How did you do that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we've got to ask all. We've got we to gotta throw all the technology questions at the old guys and see if, they, uh, if their heart rate goes up. Um, uh, oh, shit. <laughs> Well, I, I, I don't know where you are. I don't know where you guys are on this, but I'll tell you what. I had a, I, I was just at a great conference that Craig Liebenson put on at Exos um, with uh, people I normally don't get to talk to. It was chiropractors, um, athletic trainers, physical therapists, and uh, they were all people that were all about movement. And their, their motto was, rest is not rehabilitation. And, tr and rehabilitation is training. So they weren't about, you know, any of this other stuff. But one of the things that they came out was they, they talked a lot about underloaded and underprepared. That's what they think is happening out there more than anything in this group. And, and I think Rob makes a good point about comparison. Like, I, you know, I don't mind resting somebody when they've been trained, but they better have been trained to a point where they need rest. You know, otherwise you're just making it worse. So now you're just resting for the you're resting for the sport. Is that is that the thing? I mean, if we're, is that all we're doing? Then we're just at ground zero the whole time. We haven't progressed at all. I mean, we're we're keeping you out of the game because the game is crushing you, and that's not usually what happens. So I always wonder where, you know, first of all, this load management thing to me is a little bit off by virtue of the way they define it. Right? When we talk about Oh, hey, we can just do load management, really reduction in injury. Like, really? That's not my goal. My goal is increase in performance. <laughs> so, and if I increase performance, I'm probably going to have a reduction in injury. So I, 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 use, I use that data from, and I've had Catapult, and right now I've got Player Tech, which I'm trying to figure the hell out about. But even the data that I have, I'm trying to figure out how, how to perform better, not how not to get hurt. I think you, when you start putting your focus on 
injury mitigation and management, I think you stop going forward and you start going backwards. That's my take. Yeah, what's your thoughts on just, you know, baseball? Like how, there's, what, 160-plus regular season games plus playoffs. Is that too much? Or is 82 games in basketball too much and that's the problem? Or, you know, are we go, like you said, are we going backwards? Well, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, look, when you, when you look at basketball, for instance, I don't think, you know, of course, you'd have to ask my colleagues in basketball who I trust. I think they would probably say the th- same thing, that once the season starts, practice really isn't much. I'm trying to figure out, you know, what are you resting for? You know, I mean, so how much is going on in there? And that's what I want to be. If you're not training hard during the week, then you're just – and you're not doing much there, then the game is going to get you at some point. So maybe you're be, kind of between a rock and a hard spot. And certainly nobody who's ever watched a baseball and basketball game will ever suggest that the caloric output in baseball is similar to that in basketball. <laughs> so – uh you know, I mean, there's plenty of guys that played 162 games, plenty of guys that played 150, 140, and that's, that's a lot of games. I, I will tell you, having been involved with it, though, if you don't think hopping on a plane and traveling around the country doesn't tire you out, it does a lot. And I wasn't doing shit. So, you know, I, I was training people and enjoying my beer on the plane with my sandwich and and man, you just, you can't imagine how hard that is. So again, I think, I think the problem with baseball is not the games. I think it's the travel, um, to be fair, because I mean, the game's not asking all that much from you. And we were able to train on the day of games. So I think that also explains to you a little bit about the game of baseball, you know, um, and I think that load management in baseball, yeah, I think it's probably important. Uh, but I don't think it's, I don't think it's crucial to the degree that we're, you know, we're, we're looking at, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I think it's, you know, we're looking at a couple, three days a month, but you know, in baseball, you have the luxury of saying, okay, I'm a right-handed hitter. Let's look down, you know, because you're going to get your starters ahead of time. So you can look a couple of weeks ahead and see if there's a right-handed guy throwing on the day you're a right-handed hitter, that might be your day of rest, but that doesn't, you know, typically on those days, we would train. Oh, you have that day off? Okay, let's let's get get some training in. Uh, but basketball, I'm not so sure about. I mean, I mean, my my gut is that there's just not enough hard training going on there, um, and so you got to think about: well, should we train hard enough so that we that that the rest actually pays off for us in basketball? Or are we just resting to try to catch up uh, all the time? Do you think it's difficult? you know, yourself being somebody who was employed within a professional sport for you to be the person to say, we need to do more work, not less. Is that difficult for a lot of people thinking that they're going to piss people off, players off, and maybe get blamed for injury? Well, that certainly has never bothered me. (laughs) (laughs) But, uh, well, I mean, again, you know, this was a while ago, but if I went into Billy Bean and told him, look, here's what we need to do, he'd say, okay. (laughs) <laughs> let's go let's go do that you know I mean we he he leaned on us a lot in athletic training and myself Barry Weinberg Larry Davis um Steve Sales I mean we had such a great relationship and I mean this this conversation can get super wide I mean I look now and some of these high performance models have so many people involved with them that it's not high performance I mean the communication is horrible I was talking to, to um uh, to Paul De Podesta, who's in the in the Browns front office right now, and I was talking to him about this very thing. He said, "You know what? You know, we had a good thing going because it was it was me, you, Billy, the manager, and the trainer. Our high performance team was five people, and we were the head of each one of our departments." He said, "And we saw each other every day. I mean, it was the difference between me and right down the hallway." And so some of these, you know, these things get crazy. We all thought the same way. Now. I think there's so many people now that, again, you think you're increasing communication and you're not. My point is that I think it's likely that you'll have some disagreement throughout that group where there shouldn't be. I mean, that's a hard thing to do, and and everybody can sense it when it goes out there. You know, should we rest this guy or not? I don't don't think that that conversation uh, about uh, uh, Kwame, was it, or who was was the start of this whole thing? I, I don't think 
I don't think it was a unanimous decision to arrest him. I don't. Now you have agents involved, <laughs> which never was the case before. Rob can tell you that. And, you know, you got to pay attention. So, you know, I think it's more, more than science now. But, no, I mean, look, I, it's my responsibility to go in and tell them that now. And I kind of act like – kind of like the um, chief of staff. Like, I got to tell you. I have to, I have to m tell you what I think is true. Now, whether you do it or not, I have to be prepared for you not to do that. But I can't not tell you that because I think you won't like it. So, of course, I would tell. And, yes, to your, to your point, yeah, people are going to get pissed. And I think that's something else. But, I mean, that's never uh, – Yeah. Um, <laughs> do people think the culture has changed around all of this type of discussion? Like, do you think somebody had mentioned like social media demands and all these other things like, you know, on players, like they're so stressed. Um, do you think the culture around physical work has changed and the expectations around physical work? Like, can you get this player to work hard or is it just like, nah, get out of my face kind of thing? Is it different now? Well, I say generally speaking, yes, but I would say it's also um, what's sport specific, you know, okay. um, unfortunately. Um, so, uh, well, I, I, the problem now is they have a bunch of people saying, can you hear me? Yep. No, no, we just lost you. Hello. It's bandwidth oh. management. Okay, well, Rob, do you have any thoughts? Well, uh, yeah, I think it's the culture you create in the organization. You know, I, I think that, you know, kids want to work. I think kids want discipline. I think kids want leadership. I do. I believe that. Um, I think that it becomes, you know, senior management and lets them get away with what they're going to let them get away with. You know, prime example, if you look at the New England Patriots, right? Someone comes onto the Patriots, they may sign somebody and look, look what happened with Antonio Brown. I mean, this is the culture. This is what we do with the Patriots. This is the way you act. This is our culture. You're going to work hard or you're not going to, whatever it may be. But you're going to adapt to the culture that's set there. And the, and the, the most difficult uh, time you're going to have is going into a, a situation that doesn't have culture and setting that culture, right? There's a big difference between having discipline and accountability and having rules. There's a big difference between the two, right? And so I think if you set the right culture, you will have the, the results and, and the, the conduct that you expect, but with setting that culture, there has to be accountability for the people that don't conform to that culture. Yeah. At what point does losing like motivate people to work harder? Like, you know, I'm on a crappy team, like rather than point the fingers, like we all have to work harder. Is that, I mean, is that, is that a solution nowadays? I think the other side is more difficult. What if you're working so hard and you're losing? Yeah. How do, you, how do you keep them motivated to keep working hard? And that's a real talent. But, um, you know, you just hope it, that's the bottom line, right? You, you've got to have the talent to win. And hopefully that the work that you do as a strength and conditioning coach enhances performance and prevents injury. But, you know, if you've got AAA ball players, you know, playing at the professional level, you're not going to have much success, right? So... I would assume. So, um, you know, you better have some talent as well. Yeah. Well, I mean, the truth hurts sometimes like, Hey, you're just not good enough. Bob, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're no, back I'm back. I got it. I found out how, again, my, uh, my technical skills are just, you know, out of this world. So I'm back <laughs> on in, in another form. I can't remember what I was talking about, but, um, well, we kind of talked about culture and oh, right, you know, right, right. Can, yeah. Can, can well, you get after people? Yeah, I think you can. I think you can. Uh, but the other part of it too is, you know, that th these people also have the chance to look on the internet and, you know, what, what we end up getting 
well, I think everybody gets it now, but, you know, how come I'm not doing what LeBron does? How come I'm not doing McCaffrey's workout? You know, what about, you know, and so then you have to explain. And it's, it's the same explanation we gave years ago. Well, you're not LeBron. You're not McCaffrey. But unfortunately, that's, that's not influential enough anymore. And so now you have to you figure it out. And like in baseball and in football and in basketball, now they, you know, they go home and away and they're away from you and they do God knows what. And you're kind of stuck with that, you know? So I, I yeah, I do think you can, but again, it, I, it goes back to kind of the position I have now, you know, as the senior associate athletic director in charge of performance and student athletic welfare without the AD, I, I'm, I'm nothing, you know, I'm, I'm a, I'm a bald guy sitting in an administrative room. That's all I am. So, uh, but now I can go in there and say, coach, you're not involved with athletic training. You're not involved with nutrition or strength and conditioning. And that's the way it's going to happen. So it's, again, it was like kind of with me with the A's with Billy Bean, you know, that's what we did. There was no argument. And, you know, our success was a bunch of stuff. It wasn't just the strength program, but we certainly had our expectation in every one of those departments. We followed it and ended up kind of being successful in the end. Now I don't think it's that way. I really don't. Not, not, I shouldn't say not many places, you know, not many places. Yeah. And I don't know how many places would admit that they're backing off all the time and they're not working hard. Like that's, you know, we're not going to get that admission, but uh, Luca, you had a point you want to make Luca? Or is uh, he got sucked by the cyberspace uh, barrier too? Um, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know what the answer is. I do get the impression that there, a lot of this stuff is motivated by fear and, and who's going to step up and say, yeah, you need to work harder. You don't need to sit on the bench. Sorry, Luca, you had a point you wanted to make? Oh, there you are. Oh, gotcha. Okay. There you are. Sorry, you wanted to make a point, Luca? <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. Um, we should have a preseason so that, you know, we can iron out all these glitches, you know. <laughs> We just <laughs> start about with some simple topics. Like we'll just talk about the bench press one week, and if we screw that up, nobody really gives or we a need, shit. We need like an energy drink sponsor that like ships it out to each of you, and you just like knock it back beforehand. Uh, like, that's funny, dude. This is crazy. You know, try. I know it's Sunday night. You know, I know there's. I don't know. Is it, is it Thanksgiving weekend in the U.S.? Uh, no, next no. weekend. No, next week. Next week. Yeah. Okay. There. Okay. So you don't have that excuse either. Um, <laughs> Not full of Turkey. You're, you're carb loading. Yeah. So, but I, yeah, I, I hope this thing goes away, but I don't think it's going to go away. What do you think is going to happen in the next couple of years? Anthony, hey, we're going to get Anthony to speak up. Speak up here. Oh, Oh, we can't hear you. Sorry, Anthony, we can't hear you. There. Oh, you got me now? Yeah, got you. Okay, awesome. From from my interpretation of what I've what I've read, and um, I mean, I've been, I'm in a clinical setting, so I don't apply this regularly. But from what I understand, it's never a question of uh, the ideal world. You want to you know over prepare and create a buffer zone to have you know a, a wide bandwidth and a large chronic workload, but does this fit in a place where we're dealing with individual variation, we're dealing with non-ideal scenarios like we we're discussing where, you know, an athlete is having contract negotiation issues or someone's coming back from an injury. And it's somewhat of a way for us to track these variances between, you know, acute workload to chronic workload and protecting against spikes that some of this research shows significantly increases risk of injury. So I, I think that's where maybe the data comes into play to say, you know, we set a, <clears throat> within this injury risk, predic risk prediction model, right? We set, a, we set a number that says, if I go over this point, should I be concerned? Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, that's a fair question. I don't know, like all of my, my background has been like, you know, what Bob, Rob, Ryan has said is like, you know, I, I, I create those 
reserves by making people, you know, really good on all their endurance work, all their strength work, all their speed work, like, you know, and, and anything that we encounter in season is really going to be a lot less than what we've done in the off season. So I, you know, I understand what they're doing with some of the, the, the data collection, but I guess if they don't have the, the, the training behind them, you know, you know, maybe, maybe it is a problem. I don't, I don't know. Does anybody else have a point? Ryan? I, I guess like if you're, if you don't get that preparation time and you're working with a half deck of cards, is it something where you may need to be a little bit more tight? You may not have as much of a buffer zone. So you might need to be able to be a little more controlled if you don't have the off season preparation that you maybe was often more desirable. I guess. Play there. I, I mean, I, I guess, I guess that's the reality is, you know, people walk into training camp and like, what have you done? Nothing. Fuck you. And then, you know, then you're off to the races, right? Like, I mean, that, maybe that's what it's like. And is your, if you take a job with a pro team, that's up to you to like suck it up and deal with that situation. I choose not to, but you know, uh, I don't know, Ryan. So, I mean, obviously when a person comes to you and they, they, we might have to be what you said a little tighter. It depends on what we're trying to be tied on. Are we trying to be tied on volume? Are we trying to be tied on intensity? Are we trying to be tied on days of work effort? I think obviously, again, that's, there are no absolutes that's sport dependent. But I think one of the things is, is that every athlete needs to be stretched a little bit in terms of their capability. They need to be overloaded a little bit. One of the interesting things I've found is there will be, because we've done some of this just with my own kids, like, you know, RPE data, right? And you'll find out that they felt like, you know, oh, this day was a 10 and maybe there might've been a couple of days where it was really high on that scale. And most coaches would go, oh, well, now I got to back off because we've, we've, the kids are perceiving it this way. Well, there's some truth to that. But then two weeks later, they usually hit their best performance ever. So it's like you have a necessary amount of work that you've got to do. And sometimes we've got to push them through that, I feel like, crap phase to be able to make sure that at the end of the season in the playoffs or the championship phase, whatever it may be, that they're eventually prepared to handle that. Now, the mastery situation of that is you kind of feel like you're flying an airplane with duct tape in both hands trying to hold the wings on, but you got to ride that line. And if you don't, you'll never get to that elite performance that you want them to be at. You know, and if you underload them, you're not even in the conversation. So then you just got to figure out ways to support them through those typical things that they're going to experience. Like, hey, you're not going to sleep the night before a competition because you never do. So Thursday night, you've really got to focus on that being your sleep night. You know, make sure that you're getting this type of food in your system. I know we've had uh, Stuart McMillan has been talking about, you know, should we talk about diet or weight? Well, maybe we don't talk about diet or weight in terms of what we can produce, but what we can add in, right, to be able to help them regenerate their tissues and eat right and feel better as opposed to just eating, you know, drinking some of this stuff, you know, and uh, eating eating whatever the heck they want to eat or whatever they have available to them, you know, and try help them make smarter choices through that way. But I feel like all athletes are going to feel like crap and it's our job to make sure that they can get through that phase safely and it doesn't impact our overall goals of the season. Mm -hmm. uh, Kyle, you had a point you want to make? Yeah, I guess there's just a couple of things uh, that's come up. Uh, one with the load man or with the GPS data and using that as a guideline. Um, it, seems like it's more of an afterthought process more than anything that it just gives us a guide to either one see what they're doing either in game or in practice but like it shouldn't be I feel like it's more like we're training them to get to a certain point to a ceiling beyond that ceiling and the gps is just kind of like look we've got there or um if we're coupling that with um heart rate data uh, that goes with it. Uh, we're just seeing if they're redlining internally. Maybe they've had their stressful weeks or whatever um, with training or with uh, maybe they're dealing with contract stuff or if they're in college, maybe they're dealing with exam period. And we can see some of that internal load, but ultimately we still have to train them. We still have to push them. And from the, the high school side of things, I work with a lot of uh, high school athletes and academies and I feel like we're almost coddling uh, some of the athletes too much. And I see coaches really pulling back on the athletes and they get 
easy passes to do to kind of sit back. Yeah, exactly. Feed the cats. Um, the athletes are able to kind of tiptoe around and really like slack off and um, not do the work that's necessary. Um, and they never get pushed beyond. And so they, everything's an RPE of eight, even though it shouldn't be, it's, it's easy work. Like it's, or it's stuff that they should be able to handle, but they're not used to working hard. We don't push them beyond that point. So I think um, pushing them, explaining this is going to be hard. This is going to hurt. This is like, you're going to feel soreness for maybe a few days, but like, this is a normal part of the process. And I think kids just have to get used to that factor and being okay with it and knowing that they're going to come out the other side intact and better and stronger. Um, and the, the coaches have to watch for those sorts of red flags that might pop up um, when you're dancing or treading that line. But that, that's my thought. Yeah, I, I still don't understand the feed the cats thing. I'm more of a dog guy and uh cats usually didn't do much i could take my dog for a run he could like you know fetch stuff anyways i don't get that but that's um, a bad word now dogs are a bad word and feed the cat's culture tony's gonna get mad at you <laughs> <laughs> it's because uh, tr trump trump is calling people dogs that's why um yeah i i, <laughs> I, I mean i i'll go back to that movie i saw last night and i say you should all watch it that ferrari ver ford versus ferrari and the guy who is the main driver is pushing the RPMs higher than they thought they could and pushing the brakes. And the guy, you know, ended up winning the race and beating Ferrari. And it was, it was pretty interesting how they depicted that. So I, I would say certainly you, if he was one of the developers of that car and he knows what he can push it at based on the tests they did in the track, you know, the test track, I mean, that's pretty valuable. I, you know, I don't know. And it was interesting. They had a computer in the car and he ended up pulling it out and throwing it out saying like, I'm going by feel. So I don't know, maybe that's a sports science uh, diss there. I don't know, but I, I think there's a lot of interesting things we can pull from. Sorry. You're supposed to say spoiler. Yeah. Anyways, go watch the movie. There's lots in there. Um, but yeah, does anybody uh, else have any thoughts on workload? Like, you know, even from a physical therapy point of view, I'll get Dean to jump in here and Rob and, and just like most of the people that come through the clinic are like, they don't exercise, they have no capacity, their bodies suck. Like, and it's like, okay, well, we have to get them to the point where they can do a certain amount of work. Would you agree, Dean? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. You can hear me? <clears throat> yeah, I was, um, I would agree. I just wanted a couple points. Um, Derek, I mean, since Derek has stepped in with our group, Derek has shown our crew just how much neurological change can improve that whole thing. I mean, there's so many factors that affect being able to load your client. And I, all the while, what, Rob, where you were talking about that rotator cuff example, um, I was thinking about another thing that, that to me, it's really simple. Um, you can... The, uh, my goal in rehab is to get the athlete or the, the client to be able to load their tissue to whatever capacity they need that is going to allow for proper movement, proper function. And no, one of my big markers is not pain necessarily, it's inflammation. And um, if you can't get, if I can't get a tissue to handle low, like tendon is different than fascia is different than um, capsule is different than muscle is different than bone is that so whatever it is that we're going to get them to start conditioning with, I'm not the strength and conditioning specialist. My job is to get that person to the CS or the movement specialist or the coach or whatever, to be able to get them to load. But I mean, there are certain parameters that you just have to be aware of and follow, namely that um, type one collagen takes about 30 days to mature before you can actually start loading that thing without infl inflaming. So we've got, I mean, you guys, I use a lot of PRP and stem cells in what I do, right? This is what helps me get tissue to be able to handle load, right? Strength to me is very simple. Strength, a maximal efficiency of a muscular contraction, all things being equal, all things being equal along the neuromotor chain is largely due to alignment stability of the, of the joint. So in Rob's example, if that 
rotator cuff is fatigued, there's other things that can go on as well that will, that will allow for overloading of the delt <clears throat> and cause uh, uh, superior glide to that, that humerus to impinge in whatever you're getting. That's just one example. My bottom line with this is that loading has many, many things that affect it. And once you're even all set, let's say cap, let's say joints aligned, joints aligned and stable. Okay. You've got, you're ready to start recruiting and you're ready to start training. Well, mentality is going to affect your ability to load and train and all that sort of stuff. So my Bob had a, I think Bob's still here. One of the biggest things, one of the best things I've heard said was, do you have that communication? Like does the, does the strength and conditioning specialist, the movement specialist have an awesome chain of command with the guy, the mechanic, I call myself a mechanic right? So Derek and I work in that capacity and I rely on him heavily as my movement expert. So I get the car ready and ready to be put on the track and then we can start loading it. Everyone's so like the one big thing that I have a problem with is when I, when I see other physiotherapists, I'm speaking generally, but this is a classic thing. You hurt your knee, your shoulder, whatever. Well, we're going to strengthen you. Well, what the hell does that mean? We're going to strengthen you. What does that mean? Why are we giving people exercises? I mean, I get it. If you, let the, if you let the limb just sit long enough, the neural system is going to retract. If it retracts long enough, you're going to get atrophy, right? So, uh, so there's all these principles. Why you want to actually introduce loading, and, and it's different. It's phasic. During rehab, during training, it really, really depends. But the ultimate thing is, in my opinion, you should be loading no matter what. So when you're injured, it's actually not a, it's not a bad thing. And that's what I'm con- con- coaching my athletes to understand is that injury actually allows you a chance to understand how to move through a process that is deemed negative. In fact, I don't think you can truly be a good athlete until you've been injured and have to rehab yourself through something like that. Cause it can be devastating. Most of the guys, and you've seen this Derek too, with our guys, man, these guys are twitchy, right? So it's almost like you're a part sports psychologist as well while we're getting these things, but we're just, we're, we're, there's so many parts to this. It's, it's extremely fascinating. But for me, I, I'm just, I'm a mechanic that's just trying to get that tissue to be able to attenuate, absorb, and or generate force enough to the capacity that they're going to be able to do. Once that's, once I'm done, it's out of my hands. So, and once again, guys, I use a shit ton of PRP. And, and now we're bringing stems and exosomes and things in here. Like this is phenomenal stuff if you're not getting better and within four to six treatments within my within my bracket man there's big alarm bells going off you know we had people walking in with rotator cuff tears uh, 40 50 visits out of physiotherapist i pull my on my autosounder i see a the defect in the supraspinatus and i just shake my head right so if you're eccentric loading and you've got them aligned and you've got them eccentric loading you're doing all these protocols and they're still not able to handle now what what if your strengthening isn't working, right? I mean, I'm biased now towards this, but it's something you might want to think about, just food for thought. Yeah, good point about the like the psychological piece. Like, Bob, you want to speak to it again, is that like if you deload or, you know, sit somebody on the bench and that's a habit, what is the psychological implications of constantly backing off and resting and load managing an athlete, Bob? I would say the psych, the psychology is going to come. The bad psychology is going to come with poor performance. I'm not feeling right. You know, I don't think it'll be anything you'll have to explain. You know, it's going to be in performance or injury one way or another. You just, cause you just, we all know that sport <clears throat> is going to be demanding. Right. So it's going to get you one way or another. You can't get away from it. Yeah. You know, so sports that are less demanding like baseball in a lot of ways. I mean, you could, you you could get away with a few things, right? But again, eventually, over the course of 162 competitions, you probably could track some decent results and say, "Wow, we did too little, too much, whatever that is." You know, I and and by the little too much, too little too much. I, you know, I want to know what the baseline is on is on this load management. Like, what where are they getting these numbers to derive rest from? Yeah, I tried to I tried to ask catapult a half a dozen times. Is there a way you can get a percentage of the one RM of every one of those bits of data? 
so that it will post every time I see it, right? And if and if it and if it um, if it upticks to a new one RM, then that's fine. It just I need to see percentages because as a strength and conditioning practitioner, I work on percentages every day, and so it would make sense to me to know that that load is X percent of the max load. So like I think somebody else said, it might have been you, uh, Derek, like what, where are they getting these numbers from? What, what are they basing on? Oh yeah, clearly we need to rest today. I, I don't know where that's, I'd like to know where that's coming from. I think, I, I think we'd be shocked to find out that they have really detailed data on that. Well, the other question too is like, is this gonna happen in tennis, golf, swimming track where you're dependent on do going into a competition to make your money and so if you don't go to that competition or that tournament are you going to lose money and so that's dictating whether or not you play rather than hey i got 10 other guys on my team i can sit on the bench today and still earn my check you know that's i think i think it absolutely will affect those i think now that now the first thing that people are going to say about injury is oh you weren't rested enough i mean that's that's what these that's what these tracking companies are trying to tell you yeah they, they don't say increased performance. That's not the first thing on that box. On the box is, you know, be fresh, manage injury, injury prevention, injury mitigation. Absolutely, man. It's all, you know, dig your heels in, slow down. We've done too much. Now, to be fair, I, I think there's, you know, several instances. And you could probably say that in some instances, there's probably some overtraining going on at, at the same time. Some of that also mitigates injury, right? You can't be fresh all the time. Well, that's yeah, impossible. If that's you're a really, fresh that's... now and you keep doing that, as you know, and holding peak speed, uh, you're going to just drop right off. And now you're going to have performance problems first, and then you're going to have injury problems. So, uh, you know, yeah, I, I, I think that's, you know, that's bad news. I think, and, it, and these companies have been talking about that now for a long time. That's a good point. Cause I know Tim, Tim Hewitt uh, was talking about ACLs and fatigue and he says there isn't a correlation between fatigue and ACL injury because when you get fatigued, you tend to flex more at the knee and you're in a lower position. And oh, so there isn't a correlation. Yeah. And he says there's the studies have shown that it doesn't correlate with fatigue. And I'm wondering, is that Rob, is that the same with other injuries to some degree? Like if I'm fatigued, I can't hit higher velocities. Uh, I'm at less risk because I just don't have the output uh, potential. Like, do you think there's maybe they, some of these companies are attributing too much to fatigue? Um, no, I understand what Tim's saying, and I agree with him to a great extent. I disagree in other ways, just like I said before, you know, the excessive fatigue of the cuff. If I have my humeral head migrating superiorly every time I do an overhead press because I'm so fatigued, I'm probably setting up my rotator cuff for injury, right? I, I just think, um, you know, fatigue places you at a disadvantage, you know? If you're on the field with fatigue, you don't have, you're not producing as much force. You probably don't have as much good proprioception. You probably don't have good foot placement. Uh, you know, biomechanics of an exercise is off a little bit. And I think you cumulatively over time, you could be setting yourself up for those overuse type things. That's what I think happens. That's what I think happened that 1800 rep example. I give you is a cumulative effect. And then we got to 1600 and then 1800 reps in a month and people started breaking down due to fatigue, they were excessively fatigued. I do think that in rehab, and you know, we've spoken about this for a while, our group, but I don't hear too much on the outside. Maybe Anthony can comment. You know, we, we, we have to return people to either sport, practice, or training, right? They get done with their rehab, they're gonna enter one of those venues. And I can tell you this, that it is valid, it's a valid entity. Okay, it truly is that essentially we use limb symmetry indexes. So if you want to bring up ACLs and a right knee with an ACL, what is the right leg compared to the left leg, right? We talk about multiple jumping, strength things, whatever, etc. Not many people talk about the standard of the sport, right? So if, if, if you've got a person is an is a world class sprinter, and you know they had an ACL. 
and everything is perfect when you're comparing one leg to the other, but they run 10-8. They're not doing anything. You have a rotated cuff, and a pitcher or a labrum, and a pitcher's Major League Baseball pitcher is throwing 78, 80 miles an hour. They're not doing anything. And so if you look at even at high school levels, if you look at football players, you look at Division I college prospects, well, if you're in the top, if you're in the 90th percentile, you have to be able to squat 500 pounds. Now, I don't expect a 145-pound wide receiver to squat 500 pounds, but even if you squat 390 pounds, you're in the 50th percentile. So we compare one limb to the other. We look at all different factors about comparing the body to the body, but when are we going to start comparing the return to play to the standards of the game? Because if they can't meet the standards of the game, A, how, how optimally are they, going to, are they going to perform? And B, aren't we placing them at risk of injury? Because their peers during practice, and certainly the competition on game day, has likely met those standards. So, you know, I think it's all encompassed. I think well, fatigued is too much. You're overtraining. Anybody have any right, other Rob. comments? Anthony? Yeah, Rob, getting the – the way I see it, I completely agree, agree completely with Rob. It's getting the limb symmetry is just the first prerequisite to getting them back to the sport-specific type play. So I think I'm thinking I'm stealing this from Bill Knowles, and the way I explain it to all my patients is <clears throat> when they come in for an ACL injury, um, day one I'll say, all right, this week one, your, your teammates right now going to practice are earning a dollar every single day. Mm -hmm. Right now we're doing, we're doing, you know, quad sets. You're getting maybe five cents. Okay. Maybe once we get back to five months, six months, and you can start going to some sort of modified practice, maybe just then you start getting a dollar every single day. Meanwhile, over the course of six months, you've accumulated, accumulated debt. So our job is to maybe push you a little bit harder, maybe do a little more upper body, maybe start doing more conditioning to where everyone else in this part of the process is getting 15 cents. We can bump it up to a quarter start managing that debt and then we talk about the timeline for return to injury <clears throat> stretching that out a little bit further because that gives us more time to make up some of that debt so that's been a useful analogy for me in the way i kind of think about some of the workload managing returning from injury yeah that's a good point very difficult until you get trump's tax returns though to <laughs> <that one. laughs> Well, you know, again, I, I do think too, again, that it is that one RM deal, right? So if I, ha if I have a kid who's, you know, and we have all kinds of numbers in there, I mean, I, we're finding with you, you therapist or a trainer may say like, well, I think he's ready to come back. And I say, have we tested his vertical jump, his five yard sprint? Can we, can he squat 90, at least 90% of his previous one RM? I think those things are important, mm -hmm. you know, and, and uh, I've, I've run into it a couple of times. And they, they look at me like I'm crazy. I'm like, well, we have parameters here, you know, doing the things we're doing, we, we should be able to do that. Or, you know, I, I had a kid, we, we, we started that when I was talking to you, Derek, about acceleration ladders, right? Kid came back from, and this is how the context happens. Kid came back from a ACL injury and he's playing and he pulled his hamstring once and then he pulled it again. And then I got involved and said, okay, what's going on here? And so we started looking at the way things were. And I, and I said, well, he, he pulled it twice out for a total of four weeks of inactivity. So he's out of shape. The first day back, I took him and I gave him soccer kid, right? I gave him January's training, which is week one, day one stuff. He was gassed. And, and the kid was saying, oh, I'm ready to go because it felt okay, right? And after I did that, I said, are you ready to go now? And he said, no, I'm not. I said, okay, well, so let's start back at this. So I started on acceleration ladder, jog five, 10 yards, sprint five, right? Two days later, I was asked if he's ready to go. Can he go to practice? And I said, oh yeah, absolutely. If you can guarantee me, he doesn't have to sprint farther than five yards because we haven't sprinted farther than five yards. What are we yeah. doing? And yeah. so if you look back at Hewitt's stuff, which I spent some time talking to him this weekend about ACL stuff, it's it's the same thing, you know, underprepared, underloaded, you know, people are coming back and they haven't been stressed enough. And, and don't we really want them, you know, I know as a coach, I, you know, I want him stressed in training. I don't want him hurt in a match where, you know, now this thing's falling apart. This just changes the way I work. 
So I want to make sure we, we stress them right there. I, I, and I think again, that this load management stuff is, is soft. It, 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 it connotates something negative to me. It doesn't sound positive to me at all. And again, I, 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 we talk about auto regulation and periodization and all this crap. And I'm thinking if you got to argue regulate every, every week, you're terrible at programming. <laughs> like I, I know exactly how to make my guys feel the way I want them to or girls. Right. And so I, you know, I've never got to that overtraining thing, but I do say that, you know, I, I wouldn't say overtraining Rob as much as I would say just a, a little fatigued only because baseball is an example. Like we're doing a little work now because I need you ready in six months when we get to the playoffs, I can't have you fresh now because we can't hold that just like peak sprinting, right? Peak swimming. We've got to figure out how to, how to train in there at the same time and still, but at the same time, Rob, still be able to meet the standards of the game. Yeah. It's like having an electric car that goes 10 miles and you got to charge it again. And, oh, I got to charge it again. Right. You know, that would yeah, suck. So we, and then you get the whole thing like, well, you know, we're all, the season's almost over. And I said, well, the kid's hamstring doesn't know that. We, let's get them ready to play. And finally, we got to the point where, you know, I, I ran him enough where I thought, okay. Then I said, this kid gets to play 10 minutes at the end of the half. Because if you put him in the middle or at the beginning, you know, like, oh, oh, no. You put him at 10-minute mark at the end of the half, the half's over. He's got to come out. And I think that was part of managing it, too, where the coach, that he believed in me and said, okay, yeah, we'll do that. And... uh Again, I just think it's the whole, you know, go back to the sprint thing. We don't sprint enough. We don't load enough. Now we're backing away. And one time kid says to you, oh, I'm tired, you know, and that's now the coach hears that. And then he has a bad match and it's all, it's all that. And uh, even um, Joel Jameson, you know, when he started the HRV stuff, he said his phone was ringing off the hook about, uh, <laughs> ringing off the hook about the red zone. And he had to tell people, well, yeah, we, we, we design programs to get them in the red zone. We want them there. That's not a bad place. It's, there's times where it is a bad place, but don't, you know, make sure it's contextual. Great stuff, people. That's, uh, that's almost uh, 90 minutes. And um, thanks again for offering your thoughts. I don't know if anybody's going to listen to us, um, but that's why we have these support groups, right? We can just talk to each other and feel good about it. So anyway. <laughs> group hug it is yeah yeah yeah. I, I just tell my wife i got one of my meetings this weekend so okay thank you very much and uh enjoy the rest of your sunday and hopefully we can jump on uh again very soon hey Take rob care. rob call me please you got a minute yeah right now yeah i want to call you yep yep oh, thanks whoa what what we're not family anyways look i'm gonna talk about you behind your back sometimes. <laughs> Derek. See you guys. Tell, tell them about your new car, Rob. Tell them about your new uh, car. Okay, bye. New car? Wow. <laughs>